big thank you to everyone that's joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Tamara, as Andrew was alluding to, has a hell of a track record in this industry as a composer in the world of production music. She's Canadian, but is now based in LA. And uh, her music has appeared in just like an incredible array of shows, Saturday Night Live, Fox Sports, you know, a personal favorite, The Grassy, The Next Generation, as well as The Bachelor, a ton of others, and Nigel, over from uh, Nagamo Publishing, just knows the ins and outs of this, of this industry so well. And I've always enjoyed my conversations with Nigel. So I'm really excited to get into this. Um, I'll ask Andrew to unmute them. Uh, let me know when you're here with me, guys. Hello, hello. Hey, there you are. And Tamara, are you here with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Now I'm hearing you. Perfect. Awesome. All right, so um, we'll get into this. We don't have a ton of time. Um, you know, Andrew said that stuff would be sending out at five. We're not going to be keeping everyone here till five. This is going to be running for roughly an hour. So um, let's jump into it. But I guess first, um, Nigel, I'll ask you to kind of do us the favor of really helping define what we're here to talk about. Because right off the bat, I just want to make sure for any of the folks watching and listening that they're clear what we're talking about when we talk about production music and aren't confusing it with uh, sync or sync licensing because they both involve, obviously, the use of music within uh, film and television and advertising and so on. So, uh, Nigel, yeah, can you just help define what we mean by production music and how it differs from uh, sync licensing? Sure, yeah. So we have two sides of music. We have the commercial side and we have the production music side. The commercial side is what gets all the headlines. It's kind of the sexier side of the music industry. It's commercial music, it's pop music, it's, um, you know, artist music that gets placed into shows, whether it's on the credits or the opening, opening scenes or the opening segment. Production music is all the music that happens outside of that. It's the underscore. It's the music that supports the show. Um, whether we're talking about scripted or non-scripted programming, it's the music that helps uh, drive the picture. Uh, oftentimes you don't notice it. It's when it does its job well, it's music that is kind of uh, understated, underscored, but always serving the picture and the story. Um, when we're talking about production music, there's libraries where pre-made tracks can be used for shows. Um, and then we're also talking about composers who make music specifically for a uh, picture, for scenes as well. Um, those are all fall under the terms production music. Sync, I mean, they're technically both sync, so sometimes yeah. there's confusion about that. Mm -hmm. When they say sync, they're often referring to commercial music being placed within within music. Yeah, and you're um, right. I should have clarified that myself in the question. It's, it's more of, that's just the job jargon people use so it's mm -hmm. good to clarify that it's um production music is is instrumental tracks that are utilized uh in a variety of ways to help tell stories and um yeah whether it's scripted or non-scripted I, I feel like I could have said that even more succinctly, but I think I think I got it. Across. I got it across. <laughs> no, I think that was great. Yeah. And Tamara, to kind of throw it over to you because yeah, it's a, this is a fascinating niche of the industry and yeah. one that can be a great career for those who can do it well and uh, know how to do it well, both musically but also know how to do it well from a business standpoint as the musician and composer. You've certainly yeah. done that on both fronts. So can you oh, kind of, you. Uh, <laughs> could you kind of briefly tell us your own story as a professional sure. musician and yeah, and how you got into this business? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I just always wanted a career in music. I took piano lessons as a kid and thank you, mom, for not letting me quit. Um, so I just I always loved music and I studied music in university and I took a recording class and it was in that class where we had to compose a piece of music um, on Cubase and learned about, you know, layering the tracks. And I was just in the studio for like, you know, eight hours, not taking a break. And I thought, OK, this is something there must be something to this. Um, at the same time, I was also working as a singer songwriter. So I was performing in all the venues in Toronto. Um, and I thought, OK, I think it's time to compose my own CD. That's kind of when things mm -hmm. started rolling. So um, I recorded the CD 60 seconds and the title track got on Degrassi. And uh, yes. that was kind of like the pivotal moment. And um, the episode ran for nine years across 100 countries. So it was really exciting. It was a vocal placement. And then I thought, OK, like, what else can I do? You know, like, how else can I get my music on shows? 
So I kept hearing about music publishers and I was hearing about libraries. So I started going to conferences, um, you know, in Los Angeles and just checking them out, meeting some of the panelists and started recording, just kind of literally just sitting in a chair and just going for it and just composing some music, sending it off to the libraries and started getting placements. I was getting you know, music on the Dr. Oz show and Fox sports and all these other shows. Um, so kind of just started. And I think just, uh, you know, from a musical point of view, um, you know, music is so subjective and I know us as artists, we're so we're sentimental human beings, right? We're very emotional. We know how to convey emotions, you know, through our music, but, um, I think just some elements to consider, um, of course, you know, melody and rhythm, do you have your like signature hook in your music? So someone hears your piece and they're like, ah, that's a Tamara piece. That's a Nigel piece, you know? Um, and on the technical side, you know, I'm still learning every single day. So collaboration has been awesome. So finding a really great team to work with, because you can help each other with your recording skills and technical skills, um, and just kind of getting to work and learning on, a you know, your job choice whether that's Pro Tools, Logic. Um, yeah, so many factors involved, but I think just kind of start somewhere and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just, just kind of go for it. That's awesome. You mentioned a, kind of a number of points there that I want us to kind of dig into more detail um, on over this next little while here. Sure. But first, I presume that not every musician, even, you know, very talented musicians or even musicians that have had some commercial success, um, you know, with their, you know, popular music or popular style of music, whatever. I'd imagine not every musician has a precise skill set that's needed to really succeed and do what's necessary within production music. So, you know, both from a technical standpoint, but also from a musical standpoint, like what's the base skill set that someone needs in order to get into production music? Yeah, I think, um, you know, are you able, again, to convey the emotion through your music? It's all about, like what Nigel was saying earlier, you know, can you carry the music through the scene? Because it's there to help a scene, even though it's in the background, maybe music not to be noticed. It's there to propel a scene, to move the scene forward. And I think also, like, the amount of music that you need to create, um, you have to just crank out a ton of music just to get that steady, you know, Or you do it, I think you'll just, you know, keep getting better and better at it. I'll, I'll just add there. I mean, it's a great point. It, it's totally a numbers game with production music. The more tracks you have, you essentially are building your own catalog that can live in various libraries. And so, yeah, the, the name of the game is is quantity for sure. Uh, the quality should not suffer. And I guess on the, the technical side, most libraries expect you to deliver uh, commercial ready music uh, mixed final mixed um, and mastered to some degree as well, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's, for instance, you know, I, I work with uh, Nagamo Publishing and there's an element of our, our library that um, is a bit of, offers some mentorship. So if we're working with new composers who are really great on the creative side, they can, you know, pull together some really great ideas, but maybe on the mixing or the mastering end, um, we can offer a bit of guidance there and offer a bit of technical help. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's offered in, in various ways to some libraries, maybe not as well. Um, but you should assume going in that, I mean, the competition is high and, and, and a lot of people are, are very, you know, honed in on their skill set. So it's essentially making sure you're delivering, um, you know, a production commercial ready uh, track. And, and we, we can get into like, the cut downs and stems and all that, you know, the even deeper end of it, but that's kind of the expectation for libraries, I think at this point. Interesting. You know, one of the fascinating things about production music is just how different it is from writing conventional songs. Uh, the structure and composition are, it's almost like two different languages <laughs> in a kind of way, I, I, I think. So, um, and both of you can weigh in here, obviously, you know, how does the structure and composition of production music differ from, you know, quote unquote, typical songwriting. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, it's like a different beast, right? So um, I think, you know, music is storytelling. So if you are writing production music or songwriting, you always want to tell the story through your music. Um, 
you know, it's typical songwriting. You have your intro, your verse, your chorus. You have these catchy rhythms, these catchy hooks. Um, you know, if you're writing for a library, you always want to have that instrumental version. So an editor can kind of duck out the vocals and just have that instrumental. Um, but yeah, production music, like, you know, Nigel was saying, you have, you know, it's a totally different totally different ball game. You know, cues are about, which are the piece, pieces of music are about one and a half to let's say two minutes long. And I always kind of want to think like an editor, like, um, you know, starting small, creating a build, maybe dividing the, the piece into three parts. So let's say if the piece is, you know, 90 seconds long, then each little part, each build is about 30 seconds. Um, you know, and just keeping that steady emotion throughout. So if I'm writing, you know, sad piano, I don't want to have like this cheerleading section at the end because, you know, the editor kind of goes in and like does a search and looks up sad music. So you want to keep just like that single emotion throughout the piece. Um, and again, like Nigel was saying with, you know, cut downs and different alternate versions. So um, if your piece has guitar and piano, strings, um, you know, violins, maybe an editor just wants, you know, a drum and bass version, which is so, you know, it's used all the time in like reality TV because they don't want it to interfere with the dialogue or like just the piano or, you know, no melody at all. So it just, it just depends. Um, and then again, just the key of like, you have to just keep writing a piece and then going to the next one, just, you know, keep cranking out out your music <laughs> yeah if i could just jump in tamara's ass yeah speaking, absolutely like, very important here it's like thinking like the editor um because mm -hmm. it's we often want to think like musicians but you have to think like where is this music ending up and so you're an editor and you're you're tasked with filling 40 minutes of programming with music you got to think like how can i get make their job easiest um one thing i'll just add i mean tamara you said it really well one thing I'll add is like, I think in terms of density, um, whereas like maybe the tail end of the track has the most going on. And, and she talked about sort of ramping up super important where, you know, maybe the scene doesn't need all this instrumentation, but you're offering kind of three variations of this theme that you're creating throughout the track, um, slowly kind of ramping up in intensity because yeah, you don't really kind of want to repeat yourself. And we all know you can't start big and then go small. You tend to kind of go small and then, and then get bigger. So density is an interesting topic. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Nigel, you said you've, you know, at Nagamo there, you guys will sometimes mentor musicians who are, who are new to this and who have, who you can tell have the potential and have great ideas and that kind of stuff, but need some honing, you know, need someone to help hone the skill and the ideas and that kind of stuff. For those who are new to this, those who are skilled and, as you see, have the potential, but who are new to this, what's the part that you find people have the hardest time kind of wrapping their head around or getting used to? There's, there's like, I feel like we, if you're a songwriter, singer, songwriter, you come from a place of like, like we're so trained to think of pop music as having to be exciting and bombastic and right off the top. And it's got to cram every little earworm and hook in there. And it's, it's got to do a lot. And I find with production music, it sometimes like the simplest tracks will work the best. And it, it's not, it's removing your own like artist cap and putting on like a completely different mindset, which is tricky I feel like you approach music because you want to express what's inside of you and you want to share, share your, your worldview and your feelings and things. But production music kind of demands a different thing altogether where you have to think, I mean, whenever I'm making a cue, if I'm not working to picture per se, and I'm just creating a cue, it's always like, what's the story that I'm seeing in my head? What's the scene? Like, what am I, what's the music trying to do? What is it, was it trying to evoke? And Tamara said it really well, like if, if, if an art, if the editor is looking up sad, poignant music and, you know, you certainly want that theme to have happen throughout the, the track. And I think, you know, with pop music, sometimes there's a tendency to like switch to a bridge that's completely different from the chorus and have like a really crazy intro and all these things to kind of keep you in. Whereas production music is a bit more subtle. It's a, it's a bit more subdued and, um, you know, it, as someone who I'm guilty of this, where I, I 
you know, you're working in your dawn and it's like, you're feeling creative and the flow and I can add this and I can add this. And, oh, they're going to love this. And then it often, it, you know, you get back from the creative team. It's like just that simple little thing was actually working the whole time. And it's like, Oh, okay. You, you, they're not paying you to press all the buttons. They're paying yeah, you to yeah. press the right buttons. And so mm. it's, it's, uh, I mean, in a nutshell, that's kind of it. It's a deeper conversation though, but it mainly comes down to like, what are you visualizing? And, and what's the scene that this music's trying to evoke and support. Mm -hmm. And I think that's tricky for some songwriters who, who they just have that feeling inside that they're really trying to evoke through their music. And you're kind of asking them to like, put that aside and, and approach something, you know, slightly different. Uh, it can be tricky at, that, at the beginning, I think. Totally agree. Oh, sorry, Mike. No, I was actually just going to throw it to you to get your thoughts on that. And yeah, what you no, found. I yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying, Nigel. It's so funny, like the most simplest tracks are the ones that are always used because it just doesn't get in the way, right? Like of the dialogue. So I totally agree with you. It's funny. I remember writing like this very dark horror piece thinking, oh, it's going to land in like some scary movie. And it ended up at the WWE, like in the wrestling ring. And like <laughs> these two wrestlers were having this like heated like discussion. And then you hear my like, scary track so it's like you just never know and i think with production music it's so fun because that's the whole thing you're not writing you're writing off spec for the most part not to picture so you don't really know where it's going to end up so it's always like an adventure when you know you see your your placement say oh okay that's interesting they chose wow they just chose like the drum version or they just chose like oh just my bass so it's just interesting you might put in all these melodies and like nigel was saying they just go for such a simple simple track so mm -hmm. always, always fun to see that i was i was i was watching kitchen kitchen nightmares the, the other day for some reason it came on and and i was like shocked to hear how much music was actually in the show like there isn't a second where the music there isn't yeah. music and it's constant cues and you're listening to some of the cues and it's like okay that's like kind of like a horror sounding thing that's kind of like an intense thriller thing in the context of like gordon ramsay critiquing a kitchen like it's has a different context but it just goes to show like you may be making something with a certain thing and then all of a sudden it gets used in a different um, context too. So I don't know what the answer is there, but just thought I'd throw that in. It's a funny observation. Are you guys even able to watch television as a, like a normal person anymore? Or are you just always <laughs> no. listening for music cues? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of hard to like look at TV in the same way, kind of like closing my eyes and hearing, okay, what piece did they use and what sounds did they use? All that that kind of sounds like the sound that I use in my sound library. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's just you literally go with different ears, different eyes for sure. And it works really well. I notice really well in some of the new shows, mm -hmm. like the the Michael Jordan uh, documentary had really great music. Oh man, it did. Yeah, and I remember just feeling like, okay, I got to make something like that. Try to <laughs> replicate that. that happens a lot. I, I'm just going to give a heads up to, to everyone watching. I should have said this off the beginning. Put your questions. We're going to do a Q and A at the end of this. Put your questions in the chat. Andrew um, is monitoring the chat and is going to be uh, uh, curating the questions for me to uh, pass on to Nigel and Tamara at the end of this. So, anyways, just uh, just that heads up. Um, where were we? Oh yeah. In terms of recording setups and Tamara, you mentioned, you know, you're using your DAW of choice and that kind of stuff, but you know, when it comes to recording gear and skills, most of the composers are going to be doing this in their own home as I'm guessing, uh, how elaborate, how expensive, you know, what do you need to be doing this on a, uh, on a professional level, but kind of like what's the, the base starting point for doing so? Yeah. I mean, I definitely don't think you need anything super fancy. I mean, if you have a computer, you're like 80% there. <laughs> so, um, you got your computer, pick your DAW choice, whether you want to use, um, you know, Logic or Pro Tools, Cubase, whatever, whatever works best for you. Some people say, you know, what's the better choice? It's literally whatever works, you know, whatever you like using. Um, you know, I'd suggest also getting some, you know, a set of speakers, some great headphones, um, a second monitor. So if you're working from a laptop, it's always good to have another screen kind of behind you. So not everything is so squished um, and a really good chair because <laughs> you're going to be sitting in that chair quite a bit unless you're in a stand-up desk, which is another option. Um, I, uh, get a I, I tried the stand-up desk thing. And oh, how did it go? I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. It's not that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, I felt really like progressive when I started doing it. And then a couple of weeks in, I was like, I, I need a chair. This is too much. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it may work for you. Um, sorry to cut you off. Tomorrow. 
Oh, no, no worries. Um, oh, yeah. And an audio interface just to be able to record your, you know, focus right makes pretty inexpensive. I think it's like 100 bucks or so. Um, and, you know, you can plug in your your microphone, record your your piano, um, guitars. So, um, yeah, I mean, you again, you just have a very simple setup. And it's also like who's behind the controls, right? So, um, just, you know, learn as much as you can get some really good sound libraries, um, with technology. There's, oh, every day I'm getting more emails about like the latest sound libraries from all these different companies. Um, so maybe you just want to test a few out and see, you know, what you prefer. Um, so as you know, it's a, not a hit or miss, but you know, trial and error, right? You kind of test one out and then someone mentions another one. Oh, there's a sale coming up. Let me try that one out. So just get some great sound libraries um, and you'll be, you'll be good to go. I definitely get suckered into the, into the sales bit. Um, one thing I would add is I was, I was shocked to, to find out, I mean, don't ever get swept up in this idea that you need the most expensive plugins and the latest and greatest thing. Like I know people who are working at like a really high commercial level who have very impressive careers and backgrounds who utilize stock plugins because they tried everything else and they realized, oh, I mean, the stock plugin does just as well as it. So like you don't, you know, the accessibility for the, the top of the line, I think Tamara is right. Like it comes down to libraries, sample libraries and like where you're getting your sounds from. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you can you can do a lot with with stock plugins, and that's just to encourage people who may not have the, the the finances right now or the setup to like get the you know start collecting gear and stuff. If you have the computer and you have that sort of basic thing, um, you can go pretty far with it. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's questions coming in in terms of like how to get your music into the libraries and that whole process, which you're going to get to in a minute. But just in terms of the tracks themselves, again, what's the average? duration of a track and how many versions of a track are you typically packaging together to send to a library? Um, I generally make the cues around one and a half to two minutes. I mean, every library is different, it's kind of standard. Um, and yeah, I just kind of make them about two minutes long and you basically, you know, there's a lot of editing involved. <laughs> so you might have one track and like have, you know, 30 different versions. So it just depends, you know, what the library needs. So again, like I was saying earlier, like you might just want, you know, different alternate versions. So a drum and bass version, a version without the lead, without the melody, um, version with the vocals. If you're doing a song version without the vocals, um, and Nigel, earlier you're mentioning about like the different cut downs, you know, so some libraries, you know, you want like a 15 second version, a 30 second. So like the editor can physically take your track and place it right in that 30 second spot um, at 60 seconds. So there's definitely a lot of editing involved. So you always want to think of this as, as a business. It's an art, but it's, I mean, it's such a big business and the editing portion is so prevalent. Um, in production music. So um, yeah, uh, definitely try not to get too burnt out and have your smoothies <laughs> in the morning for lots of good energy um, for the day. Nice. That's my just, just, just to add to that, um, the the alt versions, like it, it it's helpful for the editors, but it, it's also added revenue stream for yourself. So yeah. if you have like stem like a stem of a, of a track can get can get licensed and that's a revenue stream right there and then maybe another stem from the same track can get licensed separately so the more options you have to dissect the song um and the alts she was saying the alts are really helpful for us for instance we are an indigenous music library so our niche is is offering music that has those traditional samples of often it's vocals but not every you know, production needs those vocals in it. So we offer alt versions of those. And the importance is there is like the editor doesn't have to go and implement all the stems without the vocals just to get that alt version it themselves. We can offer it right off the top. Um, so I've seen, I've seen tracks get utilized in many different ways because they offer all those different options. Um, one thing we also ask for is loops as well. Um, just loops versions. Cause you're considering like bumpers and stings and, and short little moments um, and they can be very short. So offering the editors as many uh, options as possible. The loops are kind of interesting because sometimes right. you get, the loops are tricky because some, if it's like a beat driven song, it's easy to just to cut it on the one and, and find the loop. But if it's like a, swelling orchestral thing where everything kind of overlaps 
mm-hmm. little, little trickier to find the loops, but it's it's doable. Um, and that is just for the editor to be like, I like this song, but it needs to be 15 seconds longer. I'll just add a couple loops in there to extend it, what have you, um, mm-hmm. if, they, if they choose to do that. So, uh, yeah, it's nice. pretty... Yeah. When it comes to production music, again, separating that from... Um, sync as in syncing popular music but for production music do most shows are most shows currently using uh, production music libraries or do a significant number of shows particularly in canada do they do any of them really work directly with a musician to compose specifically for that show yeah i mean i think you know with tv you have your scripted and your unscripted shows like nigel you were saying that um as well earlier and um So, you know, there's still work with a lot of composers on scripted series, right? You might have one composer, you might have two composers, depending if the deadlines are really, really quick and they need to get, you know, a couple of composers. But I'd say definitely like reality TV, where it's like wall-to-wall music, there could be like 40, 50 different tracks for each 10 seconds. They're going to go to music libraries, you know, because it's quick, it's accessible, super cost-effective, and they can literally go in and search and get tons of music immediately for download. So um, yeah, libraries are used all the time. And again, especially with, with unscripted music, because they just, there's just so much of it in libraries and it's just super accessible. So Mm -hmm. a large part of the job is like getting buckets of music together for editors. They need, okay, we need a bunch of cues like this. We need a bunch of cues like this. And it's like, okay, well, we can offer up this, offer up this. So as they're editing, they can just pull in um, what'll often happen is, they'll with their final cut or close to final cut they'll place library tracks in there and maybe majority of the tracks are working and they'll keep them and then they'll find the the moments where okay a composer's touch is maybe more needed here and if there's a budget for it um as tamara said it's often the, the the scripted shows that go for the composer because i think they just ask for a bit you know they demand a bit more nuance a bit more subtlety and a bit more attention with the music as opposed to sometimes maybe library music's a bit you know, it is, it's already ready-made. It doesn't necessarily know what the scene's doing. So it's harder to like fit it in sometimes. Um, so we, I've seen a combination of those, those two things. Mm-hmm. Totally. And just, just, sorry. Yeah, um, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, just to add on to what Nigel was saying, totally agree. And also I think with like the scripted shows, you know, they often want like a sound, like they want this certain vibe of the show. So like you're saying, like if they go to libraries, it's going to be like all this different kind of music where if they get someone to score it, it's just going to be this sound throughout and different variations and themes of that. So that's super helpful. Um, and there's also, I guess, like a hybrid version. Like, for example, I'm, I'm writing music for The Young and the Restless, doing songs and instrumental music. And they have an in-house composer, super talented music supervisors. And but they also go to the to live library um to the library and ask for some more songs some more instrumental music so you know it's kind of like hybrid so you know instances where they'll have an in-house composer but then also will um outsource music from other places mm-hmm. just to kind of fill in some of the other the other mm-hmm. scenes the other parts of the show how does this differ from movies i know when we think of like the big oscar winning big budget movies it would you know, a David Fincher film or something, they're going to go hire Trent Reznor to compose it and he wins his like 15th Oscar or whatever. (laughs) But, you know, most movies that we're watching, are they using production music libraries? I don't, I don't, perhaps, there's a budget difference there when we're talking about large films. Like the main thing for these production companies, you know, it's like, you know, they can't always hire a composer full time to do all the cues. It gets expensive pretty quickly. So that's why they're kind of supplemented. I would imagine that you're on a Fincher film. It's like they got the budget to get the best thing that yeah. they need. So, um, yeah, and Tamara, what do you? How do you feel? I, I think. Yeah, that's... no, yeah, I totally agree. And I think the neat part with the movies is maybe a music supervisor. There could be a composer, let's say, but they want to license a song, right? They might want your song for the end credits. So that's an opportunity for indie artists to kind of get in there and. Um, I mean, you just, you just, you never know, right? So even if there is a composer, they still might want to license maybe a few, um, you know, songs for the movie as well. Do you notice within, and Tamara, you might notice this firsthand with which of your songs are getting licensed the most from year to year. And Nigel, you'd certainly see this across a whole catalog, but do you notice trends where, you know, 
a certain type of track seems to be getting licensed a lot for a year or two kind of thing. And then for whatever reason, a different mood or a different type of track seems to be getting licensed a lot. Are there those types of trends within production music in terms of what seems to be people seem to be what people seem to want in their shows? Totally. I think like with any industry, you're always going to have trends. Um, It's definitely important to kind of stay up on those trends and kind of listen to what's out there, listen to what they're using on the shows. Of course, like indie electronica, you know, hip hop is used in like every reality TV show. So definitely I see that as a trend. Um, But again, like the other day I saw an iPad commercial and the actors in the commercial were singing from the Little Mermaid, Part of Your World. And it was fantastic. And this was like, you know, just a timeless, sweet, heartfelt commercial. And it wasn't necessarily like the trendiest thing, but, you know, in terms of the indie vibe or the pop vibe, but it was just a beautiful, heartfelt ad. So it's like, you can never go wrong with those evergreen, beautiful, heartfelt tracks that always uplift the scene. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of, um, you know, somber piano um, strings. People were, you know, they weren't in this upbeat mood, but as, you know, the months were going along, kind of changed over to upbeat, um, a little bit different vibe. So you just kind of have to pay attention um, yeah, I mean, what do you think, Nigel? I mean, I was talking to my team about this because it's a funny topic. Like, in terms of a pre- like predicting the trends, I don't think that's easier than any other uh, mm-hmm. arena. I mean, it's hard to, but yeah, I mean, for a while it was the uh, the Black Key sound that sort of blues rock was in like every car commercial, every sort of <laughs> home renovation show. There was like country hip hop. That fusion of country hip hop was a, a big thing. And then what Tamara's describing is like ukulele glockenspiel mm-hmm. like super bubbly like positive like it's a where it's a tide commercial and we're cleaning our clothes and aren't we fresh and clean like that that's been around for a while and then you get the kind of like the general like corporate inspirational music too where it's like delayed eighth notes on a guitar it's kind of like builds and it's always like this like uber positive feeling again everyone can describe music in different ways but there's certainly trends yeah i mean it's funny because i represent an indigenous company and it's indigenous uh people's month this month and you know we talk a lot about like longevity and like not tailoring ourselves to just the trends because it's important stories to tell you know outside of this month and whatnot um mm-hmm. but you we certainly can see an uptick in interest and in leading up to this month uh, we we're doing some stuff with pride. We're doing some stuff with, um, uh, city of Toronto and just various organizations that need that sort of indigenous sound, whether it's a trend or whether it'll last is up for debate. We'll see. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, there's definitely, definitely trends for sure. Is this for most musicians who are you know, in the game of production music, is it mostly a side gig for most musicians or can production music be like a good career in and of itself for musicians? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think it really depends on each person. Um, it is definitely, it's a great career. If you can crank out a ton of music and just if you're self-driven, motivated, um, I think you can definitely do it. I mean, there's so much content out there and they need so much music in so many different genres. I mean, literally any style you can think of. So um, you know, pick your instrument. And if you're a piano player, guitarist, you know, violin player, whatever it is, um, just, just go for it. If you can do that, if you're looking more part-time, if you're kind of just starting out, you know, you have your day job, maybe get up a couple hours earlier, work in the morning, go to work, come back, work for an hour or two and you get back if you can, um, just trying to do something, you know, every day to build up your catalog, to build up your repertoire, um i think you know i think it's definitely doable i know people who, i mean the, the catalog is it you're right it's like there are, i know people who are still getting checks from things that were placed years ago and i think the idea is that you're kind of building a bit of a nest for yourself and the more valuable your catalog is the long the more longevity you'll get out of it um the more varied it is if you're if you're only making a certain type of music you know there's yeah like she said the idea is to spread it out so i mean if you're in a position where you can you can afford to you know make music all day and 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 invest all that in you may not see the 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 financial returns right away often you get paid up front for commissions and whatnot if it's non-exclusive they'll just take it for free 
Um, but it's the back end that kind of is the, is the, the gift that keeps on giving. And um, that's where the, the catalog comes into play. Cool. I'm going to dig into that in a sec. But first, in terms of getting your music into the, uh, into the libraries or into the shows, what's your respective um, best practices you would advise for sending or pitching music to libraries or maybe even to productions directly? I'm curious what you have to say about this, Nigel, for artists pitching to you. But um, just personally speaking, just pitching music, um, you know, definitely do your research and check out the catalog. Like, are they even ex accepting unsolicited material? Because some libraries aren't. So check that out. Um, if you're going to, you know, send an email, just send a really short few sentences explaining what you do. If you've had any placement, is your music in any catalogs? Um, and if they're open to listening, you know, send a streamable, downloadable link, uh, make sure it doesn't expire. Some of these transferring services, the link expires in like a week. Um, so I would try places like, so Disco is a company where it's a file transferring service and you can actually look at when someone listens to your song, there's a little like red little dot and you can see, oh, they checked this out a few hours ago. That's pretty good. So you can keep track of that. So again, that's called Disco, D-I-S-C-O. Um, and just, you know, you just want to make sure that you're just really professional and this business is all about relationships. So just try to be a really professional, kind when you're reaching out, um, be short to the point. The other thing is you want to make sure that your contact information is in your track. So if you're sending over a WAV file, it doesn't hold anything. So if you type in your artist name, your telephone number, it's going to just wipe out. So if you want to add contact in your um, in the title or sending mp3s hold your your information i believe aifs do um, the other thing is a music supervisor or a publisher at a library they might not have time in that moment to download it they might download it put it in their itunes folder and listen to it you know three months later and then it says <laughs> they listen to your song and they said this is great it just says track one right so you want to make sure that your contact information it's so important just make sure you're, you enter your PRO number, your performing rights organization number, your phone number, how could how they can contact you? Do you own all the rights to the song? It's always good to have that um, in your info when you're sending yeah. over over tracks. Perfect. Yeah, metadata is so important. Metadata, yeah. In this. Metadata. yeah. And, and being responsive, like understanding yeah. that they are quite busy and probably and they're probably getting inundated with stuff. And if you do get a response, you know, be prompt, even if it's like, oh, the, took them six months to respond to me. I can wait like a week. It's like, well, you might miss that opportunity if it's a week later. I, I would say one other thing is, you know, double check your wave file or MP3, like double, like list. Cause often you'll, you'll get it really nice in the DAW and then you print it and you just assume your bounce is like just what you heard in, in your DAW. And often there'll be like a little pop or maybe the tail, like make sure your tails and your tops are, are clean. Um, sometimes I get tracks that just like cut off abruptly or there's just like weird little artifacts that kind of show maybe there wasn't a second, a second, uh, look through. So quality control, even that's as tedious as that is. Like you, you can assume you've done all the quality control in the DAW and then you, you bounce it out and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm sure it's perfect. Just doing that other, that last check just to make sure. Cause I've seen and heard a few things where, um, and myself included where it's like, oh, that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So qual a bit of a quality check. So I'm curious, Nigel, like, how do you like artists reaching out to you? Do you, um, should they kind of ask, can they send you something or what's... Gift mm -hmm. baskets, usually. Gift baskets. <laughs> that always work. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, any which way. I mean, we have a contact page on, on, on our site. We certainly get, um, you know, people reaching out through there, uh, you know, cold. We get referrals a lot. Referrals are often the sort of the stronger uh results um people saying hey check this person out or here's my, a person that i know um yeah any which way that's sort of that's sort of uh helpful if you have any examples in which you've scored to picture that's super helpful for us um often it'll be like oh i, I made this rap album or i made this rock album but you know do you think I could do stuff for picture? And it's like, they don't necessarily have anything. That's, that's fine. But just explaining the situation, how you're approaching it. Cause we don't, you know, if you have anything that's to picture, I've also seen composers who don't have any sort of experience uh, working on a project, but they'll take an existing scene and they'll remove the music from it. And then they'll score to that and just provide sort of like an ad hoc example of like, here's what I could do. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Cause 
you know, everybody wants an, an opportunity and you can recognize when someone's, you know, willing to go that extra step. Um, so yeah, it happens in, in various ways. Just being like Tamara said, like pre- precise and to the point, pleasant, mm-hmm. precise, professional. <laughs> I just made there it up. Go. Three, three <laughs> P's. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's one important thing I think we haven't talked about, which is like, what are the big production music libraries and how do people find them? People who are new to this, where do they even go about finding the libraries to, uh, to pitch to or send music to? Nigel, you want to take it? Yeah, you can, you can, uh, Google's are, you know, you know, our friend, the big ones are like art list, jingle punks, um, Something like Nagamo is like a niche, a niche playlist, and you you can find those as well. There's something called the MusicLibraryReport.com as well. That's kind of offers um, sort of like a community uh, review system, I, I guess. Um, people post different libraries and and say their experiences and how it was and what they're looking for. And so something like that is, is sort of like a community online that you can get logged into. Um, but there's there's plenty of libraries uh, in the states. Um, in Canada as well. Mm-hmm. Also, I think um, the Production Music Association, the PMA, they're here in Los Angeles. Definitely a great resource. They have a conference every year um, that all the libraries go to this year. I think it's actually going to be in person. Um, so it's a great resource for you guys if you want to check that out. Um, yeah, probably a good starting point as well as, you know, again, like Nigel was saying, like Googling um, libraries. But I think the key is really like, what is the best fit for you? There might be a great library, but maybe your music doesn't really kind of fit in. Or is there a library where there's a gap and you can say, oh, I can do this music. Maybe I can fill in that gap. So just, you know, going on the different websites, checking out their music and seeing, are you a fit for them? You know, is it, would it be a good combo for you to join that, that, um, that library? Um, time's flying by here and I want to get to the Q&A but there's some important things we haven't touched on yet in terms of just how the libraries themselves work and the nuts and bolts of the licensing and that kind of stuff so um, let's try to run through this part uh, quickly even though I know it's important but you know, what's the basic once a someone pitches music a library says great we like this we're going to add it to our library what happens from that point in terms of what's the basic nature of the license is it only once something gets licensed to to a show that uh, that anyone gets paid can you kind of just run me through the nuts and bolts of what happens with the music once it's in the library and it gets used yeah i think that's an important part right <laughs> so you want to know <laughs> so i think like how did do, how does it even get on the show right that's the main thing so Basically, you'd have the music supervisor, the editor would literally go into the portal and do a search and they go in knowing that they're looking for, you know, a certain kind of vibe. They might do keywords like the title or, um, you know, subject matter, you know, keys, different things to kind of find tracks, find music. And a whole bunch pops up, they download it, and then they can place it in the show. So in regards to when you're getting paid, sometimes there's, um, you know, an upfront fee, like Nigel say, might split it with your publisher. So if you're in an exclusive agreement um, with your publisher, meaning your music is only with that publisher, you can't sign it to another library versus non-exclusive is you can place that same track in another library. The exclusive is pretty standard, um, kind of like a standard agreement as well. So if you have a sync fee, maybe you're going to split that 50-50 with your publisher, um, so you might get a fee up front, but generally it's like the back end royalties that come in, you know, every quarter. So make sure you sign up with a PRO if you haven't. So Canada is still can. Um, and then let's say, you know, your song, your piece gets in a show. So the production company would send what's called a cue sheet and it lists all the information about the episode. So it will say your name, your PRO number, the length of the queue, the TV show, the episode, um, and you get paid depending on how it was used. So was it a feature? Was your song in the show? And, you know, the girls in the car cranked up the radio and they heard your song. So you basically are now in the show. So that becomes like a feature spot. Was your song used at the beginning, at the end of the show? Um, was it one minute? Was it two minutes? There's so many variations on payment. Um, was it the vocal? Was it just the instrumental? So different, I mean, royalties are kind of all over the place in terms of like everyone wants to know, well, how much will I get paid? It really depends. There's so many factors involved. Um, and then when it airs, you get a back end royalty. 
and hoping that it will air again and have lots of reruns. Um, and that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, Nigel, do you have anything that's else? A, that's kind a of- very good nutshell. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it is mysterious. Like you can't really give a straight answer as to like what the yeah. royalties will look like. Like ideally you get that upfront sync fee, which is nice. But as I, it was explained to me, it's like, it's based on ad revenue. So like CBC, it's per minute. So like CBC will have a different rate as opposed to CTV or NBC or it depends on sort of the the, the ad value. Uh, Unfortunately, we seem to just be in a world run by advertisers. Um, uh, But Netflix streaming, I mean, I know people who have worked on shows for that. Um, and it's like the back end's pretty small for, for streaming. And that's because the, the broadcasting rules were different. The internet's not the same as broadcasting on a network. So it was kind of like a wild west situation. I think we're seeing a change in that. I can only speak to Canada right now, but we just passed uh, bill C10. I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what bill C10 is, but I know it's essentially changing the CRTC, which is um, responsible for, you know, how Canadian content gets used and, and how streaming affects those numbers and the thing and things so i think we'll see some changes um but yeah it's it's the dream kind of is like the news channels because it's on every day in every country in every province state what have you um so yeah i thought i'd just add that perfect all right um let's get to some uh, audience questions here you guys uh good to do a q a all right uh, first up from Sandeep, um, if there are production musicians doing most of the heavy lifting for TV placements, then what are the chances for sync placements for conventional songwriters who happen to write a song with a similar theme, say, coincidentally? I think there's room for everybody. Honestly, there is so much content out there. Uh, if that's what you want to do, then go and do it, you know, um, I mean, there are so many shows, especially over the past year, we've all been binge watching on all all the different streaming services. So there's literally room for everything. I think the key writing songs keep it universal. So if you're writing a song about Susie and she went to a coffee shop at this address, chances are probably they may not place that in the show. But so just keeping things really generic um, that it can be universally, you know, used in a TV show or a film. Um, But definitely i think there's there's room for songwriters of course production you know composers but you know definitely go for it you know there's so many opportunities i, I hear the words you hear a lot is like working with producers like oh this track's very syncable oh it's a very syncable track and it's kind of divulged into this space where it's like we're making music just to get into commercials and to like tv shows so if you're an artist that has like a story to tell and you have like a very deep thing you know like maybe preserve keep that your own special thing you know what we're describing is is functional music it's like music that needs to be you know utilized in a certain way and it's slightly less sacred um so I, i tend to keep those two things separate where it's like i'm working on things that can just be utilized in any fashion i don't mind but then when I, you know, write my poetry and you know, I work on my deep song, you know, like I'll keep that <laughs> special for a certain thing. Um, yeah, just adding one more thing, like just listening to like what what is being used at this point. It's always changing, but there is sort of a current of sound that you can kind of pick up on. And if you're looking to get in on that, um, yeah, there's certainly room for everyone for sure. No. Uh, I, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, I just wanted to add, there's a great website, TuneFind, if you're not familiar, uh, TuneFind.com, and you literally can go check out all the music on your favorite shows. If you want to see what's kind of out there, um, just go to the website, you know, plunk in the name of, of the show, and you can kind of just find examples on um, what, what's being used. So I thought that might be helpful. Cool. And um, from Chuck. What is your inspiration for composing tracks if you don't have a brief or context? That's a really good question. It's kind of like, where do you start? You have a blank canvas. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll literally, like, I'll just start journaling and every morning and just getting out all my thoughts. Um, Object writing is also really, really helpful. Literally writing... um, you know, some words about, you know, he woke up, you see like a bird out your window, <laughs> whatever comes to mind, you just write it down so that can kind of get the inspiration going. Also just finding a show or finding a visual like Nigel, you were saying earlier and just, um, you know, score to it, just mute, mute the, um, you know, mute the, the vocals in it and the actor's voices and just kind of write to a picture, write to a picture in a magazine, just kind of 
thinking of a theme, like today I'm going to write about friendship or write about togetherness or, you know, whatever it is, just think of some themes and just kind of go. Um, universal themes, like we were saying earlier, is always super helpful. Right. One trick I like to use is, like, have you ever gotten a new guitar and you suddenly write like three songs in a week? Mm-hmm. This new yeah, instrument, new instrument is like inspired. Sure. A new instrument, a new library, a new sound can trigger like a whole bunch of inspiration where it's like, I want to explore this. Also, just like not being afraid to mimic. Like if you hear something and it's like, wow, how'd they do that? I'm going to take a stab at like making something like that. Like you often won't come out with something that sounds exactly like that, but along the way, you'll kind of find a new, a new thing that's kind of piquing your interest. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a balance of like work on the things that you know you can do. And then every now and then try a, a new thing, try to expand your, your palette and see what happens. Totally agree with sound libraries, finding new sound libraries, like, you know, a new toy, right? You have to just, it always inspires for sure. Definitely. Um, All right. From Lewis, he says, if you submit your music to a library and they actually hire you, how many tracks will they normally expect you to deliver each month? Mm. Is that a common thing that libraries are having on staff composers? Sometimes. I mean, they might, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, they might ask you like to write, you know, you want to start off with like, say like an album, maybe you have 12 tracks just to kind of get going. Every library is different. Uh, I'm with a handful of libraries. So the trick is to be able to supply enough music to fill all the libraries. Um, Yeah, I mean, it just depends. You might want to do an album every, you know, couple months. However, your, you know, your schedule can work for the library. But I mean, I think it always depends. It's good to kind of get the more music you give the more your name's going to be out there and the more editors can find Mm. you and see, oh, there's Tamara, there's Nigel. You know, I really like their music. What else do they do, right? So you really want to saturate your music and get it, you know, write as much as you can. And then you're going to hopefully get some more placements, which will definitely, you know, be a good thing with royalties. So earning money Mm -hmm. when you're sleeping is always a good thing. Um, So yeah, just as much, do as much as you can, I think. Yeah, we we often will... If we find a new composer, we'll commission maybe three tracks right off the top if we feel like we're really happy with what they're giving and we know they can, if there's someone new and we, we, we want to sort of test the waters a bit, maybe we start out with one, um, it's different. And then we get a sense of like, oh, we need a lot of music in this style. We know these people can do that. So let's give them this, mm-hmm. you know, task to kind of make this, this music. Um, so... Yeah, it's different for every library, as Tamara said. Yeah. Um, Ron asks, how many songs in your catalog do you suggest having when approaching a sync agent to mm-hmm. rep your music? That's a really good idea. Sync agent, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, you always want to put your best work out. So if you're sending over a link, you know, maybe you want to make a playlist. These are my top three to four, three to five songs. Um, just always want to put your best foot forward. But of course, you want to have more than that. So definitely have have a good size, you know, at least if you can have an album's worth of material, because they might say, great, what else can you do? <laughs> and you're like, I'll get back to you tomorrow because I better write <laughs> that song tonight. So you always want to like kind of be ahead of the game and just make sure you have, you know, a lot of music under your belt if you can um and that's where you know collaborations are so important i collaborate all the time i love it Meet some amazing people and it's just a really great way to learn from each other and get your work done quickly right because if you have this accountability you're working with somebody else you know okay you got to meet on wednesday you better make that meeting better get that song done so i think you'll crank out a lot more music as well um, at least from my experience writing songs together is always helpful working with a collaborator um, and as well if that collaborator you know plays guitar maybe you play piano maybe they can produce the track so um, yeah and just to clarify that what's what does a sync agent do and what are they doing differently than a publisher does so I think with sync agents um, they're constantly just pitching your your music they focus on the artist so um, they love the artist love getting placements for their artists um, versus a library um, you're kind of setting your music and it's sitting in a database and you know the editors and supervisors can go in and do a search um, so they're both you know working in sync but the agents are really great because they're just constantly pitching your music to advertising and um, you know, TV films and they're really focused on on the artist. 
Yeah, libraries are definitely more client focused, yeah. client face production. Um, yeah. um, Kim asks, can you use sounds and loops from logic libraries or does it have to be all original sounds? Ooh, um, sure. I mean, you're talking like the, the, li the, the library that comes in logic. Yeah. Sound? Like the stock sounds. Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea is like those, uh, Tamara, do you use logic? I do. Yes. I feel like those song, those sounds are there to be used. They're, they're pretty, I'm assuming royalty free. There's no indicator that they're, they're problematic in any way. Um, I think that's a good way of getting started. Um, there's many ways to get sounds as we we're describing libraries and whatnot. Um, but I would wave the same flag I waved at the beginning where you don't necessarily need to go for the new and expensive and all the stuff. Like if you can get that sound happening with maybe some stock, you know, some help there, there's certainly no rule or reason why you can't do that. I think you, I think they're pretty limited though, I would say. So you kind of soon realize like those sounds maybe, um, you get used to them and then you, you kind of want to go. I also know people who can like pick out like, oh, you use that sound from this thing. And they go, oh, you used drum loop 39 from, you know what I mean? So it gets, it gets on that level too, where you kind of want to find your new, your own sound. And if you're using those loops, it tends to get a bit generic. So. Okay. Um, Sophia asks, would you suggest studying music or composition in university if wanting to go into production music or is there any specific paths? either either of you would suggest to take yeah i mean i think that's definitely an option if you want to study it in school you don't have to i mean there's so many um you know if you're interested there's so many classes online i mean even going to youtube and picking out tidbits find you know speaking to your colleagues your friends um collaborators if you have um that you can just you know take a class there's i mean literally like berkeley online there's just so many courses you can take if that's what you're interested in um then i definitely recommend that but like you don't i mean you don't have to go to university for composition but it's always you know you can always learn on your own teach yourself you could be an assistant to a composer and really learn how you know shadow them and learn how they work um it's always good to to do that and see how you know the day-to-day -day works right if there's more to production music than just writing the piece there's so much business behind it the admin um you know, the amount of work that's involved. So shadowing a composer could be another um, maybe option for you. Yeah, I would say like, I know people who have gone to school for production for producing itself and all the tech and like, obviously that benefits greatly. Yeah, I would be careful because there's, I, feel, I personally feel like school has a tendency to kind of strangle the creativity and, and the inspiration a little bit and kind of put you in a bit of a, and maybe I'm exposing myself kind of speaking from a, a, my own perspective there there's no there's no harm in getting that sort of education but there's certainly something to be said for going out and kind of just doing it yourself spitfire audio has a really good channel as well berkeley online like mm. youtube is incredible right now like there's so many people who are generous with their knowledge and i think if you get to a certain level like um there's orchestrators and you know on, on a film level like there's different people who have specific roles so if you if you're interested in specific things um it's worthwhile kind of diving into that but just to get started i mean music is just to be to be i mean for i believe it's for everyone that you can you can just start hitting notes and find sounds and find your way eventually um so certainly don't let that stop you from from exploring i would say um our friend perna perna good to see you here perna is doing cool things in holistic artist development by the way check her out pernamusic.com <laughs> the uh give a pitch to for a friend but um perna asked do we need to register every piece that we submit or pitch to uh to publishers or pros like so can sound exchange so she's asking do we need to register every piece that we submit or pitch or do we just register only the pieces or specific versions that are selected for use so generally, with if you're with an exclusive publisher, they will register your tracks. Often they'll register all the different versions. Um, I see in my catalog, there's one piece, but then there's like 10 under it, like drum and bass, strings. So yeah, your publisher would be the one who would register it if you're not planning to send it anywhere. Um, I've had placements just going direct to the music supervisor where I'd keep all the publishing and the writer share. Um, so in that case, yeah, you could register it if it's kind of like a non-exclusive and you're you know, you could be pitching it for different things. 
Um, but generally, if it, yeah, if you're an exclusive agreement, I think Nigel, I'm curious what you hear, what you um, would say about this, but you know, I would assume that as a publisher, you would register your your artist tracks. Certainly, yeah. If it's exclusive, we're doing that all ourselves because we we can't trust that every composer understands the system as well as we do, and we it, it just makes things super easy when productions need that music. You just want it to be a clear sign. Um, if you're an if you're like an artist and you have some artist music that you're hoping to get placed, the worst thing is getting like a call from a supervisor or like, oh, we want to use this for a thing, and you don't have all that figured out. It's not submitted. It's like, oh, give me a week. I need to do. Um, so that that can get. So yeah, if you if you have a piece of of, of work that you're proud of and ready to share, I would say um, certainly uh, PRO PRO it. <laughs> There you go. Um, right, so we're getting near the end here. Uh, Blair asks, do instrumentals place more than vocal tracks? Um, any estimates on the breakdown of percentages? Any thoughts on the breakdown of genre? Um, generally, in my experience, um, my vocal placements have been bigger than the instrumental placements. But again, it depends how it was featured. There might be like 10 seconds of the vocal um, whereas the instrumental might be a little longer. So it, I mean, I know it's kind of, you know, it just, it really depends how the track is used, but generally a vocal, in my experience, at least, um, I got paid more with vocal placements versus an instrumental placement. But again, um, like Nigel was saying earlier, it just depends on the show, right? Was it on cable? Was it broadcasted on, you know, a network, ABC, or, you know, it just, it really depends, I think. All right. Um, let's see here. Andrew asks, where should producers be submitting music for libraries? Submi any submission leads? So we've sort of talked about this when we talked about which libraries and how to, how to, uh, how to find them and how to contact them. But, um, They'll, yeah, they'll have, they'll really have a, I think they'll have a submission link on most sites, pawn five art list, uh, Jingle, uh, jingle pongs. If you're indigenous, get at me. We're always looking for new music. Nagamo Publishing. Uh, we'd, lo we'd love to hear it. Um, but yeah, I think most sites are probably pretty accessible on that on that front. Cool. Awesome. Um, and lastly, here I saw. I'm just trying to find it, but I saw, I'd seen someone mention something about um, using samples. I'm guessing that introduces a bunch of copyright headaches. Yeah. Um, if, I mean, if it's, depends on where you get your samples from, we source our own samples and we have like an exclusive library to us that we share with our producers exclusively, which is cool. You can also go through splice and things like that. Like those are open for, for samples. Uh, if, if it's not cleared, you're going to probably run into some issues. And I've heard so many stories of like songs getting big and used and it's like well where did that sample come from and then it's it's a headache for the music supervisor themselves and the editors because mm -hmm. then they have to do all this homework and tracking people down and often it'll be like easier to not use the track at all and just get a different thing um so i would be careful with the samples um just sourcing them properly knowing um the royalty free or wherever they're coming from mm -hmm. tamara you might have a, another approach to that yeah, no, I totally agree with what you're saying, Nigel. You just have to see what you're getting into <laughs> when you're using that. So, yeah, cool. totally agree. Where, just a quick question for me. Um, libraries like Premium Beat or Shutterstock Music and that that advertises royalty-free music, where do they fall into this? And are they people you should be pitching to? Um, I don't personally use any like royalty-free libraries, but um, everyone... Um, yeah, I think it might be a little bit of a different ball game um, than um, yeah. So for me, I just I don't kind of use any um, royalty free. Um, big believer in earning your royalties and having that back end when your music is placed. Um, just from a personal point of view, but um, yeah, just what do you think, Nigel? And is she talking? Free? Is she? Are they talking about like royalty free music that you can sample into your own music, or or just like or like earning? Um, this was just for me because I've seen, oh, okay. you know, whether whether it's like for people for YouTube videos and that kind of stuff, we often yeah. see. And I know like Shutterstock Music is just one that comes to mind that always advertises yeah. as like free stock music and that kind of stuff. From the musician standpoint, are they? Do you want to be doing business with those types of libraries? I think I think you just if you just want to find opportunity for your music, but I think yeah. stock music has a bit of a connotation to it, and I think there's. 
more premium places that you can find higher quality music. And I think it shows, I think the, and I've been to like conferences. I was in a well, real screen, which is a, a non-scripted conference in, in New Orleans. And the, the big thing you hear from all these producers is like, oh, we just hear the same music all the time. It's just the same. I've heard that one track and five different shows. Like you just need, they're always looking for like new, exciting, fresh music. And I don't think, you know, a producer with their salt is looking at some stock free thing and thinking that's where they're going to get that solution. Yeah. So they, they tend to go for the, the, uh, the more trusted companies. Cool. All right, guys. Um, any last, uh, last call for questions here before we wrap it up? But um, a couple of people pressing for specific libraries that pitch you or specific sites but again use use uh use google google is your friend <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> google production music libraries and uh, uh tamara what, what was the association you said as well oh, as the, the website you said that's just a good for community sure. and finding suggestions yeah the production music association so pma music okay and and you mentioned a website was a production music report you said could be useful for finding connections yeah, music uh, library uh, report. Oh, I'm our music sorry. library report. There you go. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I think that's it. Uh, we were past our time anyway, so I do need to let you guys go. I know you're busy, but um, Nigel, Tamara, just really, uh, I've really enjoyed this. I hope folks, uh, folks uh, watching, have found it useful. But um, just thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun, and just keep creating, everybody. Just keep putting your work out there, and just go for it. Yes, echoing that is a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. And again, anyone who wants to rewatch this, um, there's a point that they couldn't jot down or something in real time. This uh, this whole webinar is going to be available for free on our YouTube channel, NWC YouTube channel. You can go there just by going canadianmusician.com slash YouTube. It'll take you there. So sometime in the next day or two, this whole webinar will be available there. And uh, everyone here who's registered will be getting uh, additional resources emailed to them at five o'clock today. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. I'll Thank see you. you so and again, much. Nigel Tamara, thank you for this. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much.